2007, I've also been research associate at the Zurich University Center for Ethics, where I'm working on a book, book project um, on intervention, on, especially on the way how the critical analysis, how humanitarian intervention, how that discourse has moved over to the responsibility to protect and this supposed move to a conditional criteria, a conditionality criteria for sovereignty. All of this I find rather suspect, and I wanted to look at this both from a legal angle, from a moral philosophical angle and a political angle, and they provided me in Zurich very kindly with this um, opportunity to do that with them there. Now, obviously, having the Morgenthau heritage, when they said, well, what's your working title for what you're, what you're doing? I said, ah, sovereignty, law, and moralism. That sounds about right. And to me, it made a lot of sense. But this, five years later, still hasn't really resonated with my moral philosophical colleagues here who say, what on earth are you doing? If you're doing moral philosophy, then why don't you call it morality? Um, and now when Scholl and Hartmut said, well, we're doing this here, do you want to do a paper? I thought this is a great opportunity because it's one thing I haven't done yet in my manuscript which is to try and unpack why I'm using moralism rather than morality and what all this might mean. So this is what I'm trying to do in this paper. And it comes in three sections. The first section really tries to situate where it came from, because this is one of the things I didn't focus as much on, I think, in, in the book on Morgenthau, where, we, where I was looking at the legal heritage, and therefore it was all about the legalism part of things rather than the moralism part. Um, so I realized I had to do my homework there, and especially also in the case of Morgenthau, where does this come from? Where is it? Where does he start using this? The second part of the paper then tries to say a few theoretical things about moralism. There isn't a lot on this. There is a very small literature that takes the word seriously. And I try to unpack a little bit of that. And then in the third part of the paper, I again try to link it back with my, my, my project there to see what some of this might mean in, um, in today's contemporary context. Um, again, a lot of this is exploratory, and I hope that I can get lots of constructive critique from you whether any of this makes sense or not. Um, so the first part, where does this come from? Not again, maybe with the deformation professionnel of the, of the legal thing that I was working on before, the thing that immediately struck me was Oliver Wendell Holmes, the, one of the um, important jurists of the late 19th, early 20th century in the US, also Supreme Court judge. He already in 1870, in his commentary on the common law, talks of moralism. So there is, there is a heritage there that I at least thought I could pick up on, which was my gut feeling from looking at this before. Right? He was all about um, arguing or criticizing the arbitrary character of juries at the time. And this is obviously the, the precursors for the whole legal realist debate um, in the US in the 1920s and 30s, where it was all about legal predictability, legal certainty, legal uniformity. Right? And then there's a moralism critique in that. Um, and again, as I, as I did in my earlier work, I showed how when Morgenthau emigrated in 1938, this was kind of the context that he found himself in. It was because at the time he was still trying to aspire to be an academic in international law, not in political science or law. That only came later. The first years when he was in, in the US, he was still doing things in, in the University of Kansas, teaching law and publishing in law journals and engaging with this critical, well, this, what he called it, crit radical legal which he brought over from his French stuff, and that he tried to situate within the legal realist debate at the time. Because that then created quite a big backlash. Um, again, this is the crisis of democratic theory then in the 30s, early 40s. I also focused on that, I won't really go into now. We had all kinds, again, religious elements, Thomas, Catholics, from that, from that perspective, criticizing and saying, oh, this legal realism just can't be it. There is more to it. And I thought that this is maybe where I could find the roots of I'm not so sure anymore after looking at this again that this is really where it came from. If you go into 1948, for instance, the first edition of Politics Among Nations doesn't use the word. There's no index in the, uh, there's no um, entry in the index either. It's only when you take subsequent editions where you then added the famous first introductory chapter in the Six Principles of Realism, where you suddenly also open the index and it says moralism, page 11. It's like, oh, okay. So that didn't work. Also, the entire big chapter he has on international morality doesn't use famous article on the twilight of international morality published in Ethics in 1948 also doesn't talk about moralism. Then suddenly something happened, and I'm actually not sure what, that from 1949-50 onwards, it's suddenly all over the place. It's in defense of the national interest. It's in all this other stuff he's writing. Suddenly it's about, and again, this comes back to what we were talking about before, where he comes 
fact, almost reminiscing about this aristocratic way of doing diplomacy versus now the moral crusade that democracy wants you to have, um, and all this kind of thing, and what you also write, Bill, in your, in your book, in terms of this, the, the short-term demand of the national interest versus the more longer-term, moralistic crusades um, of democracy. And I'm not quite sure where this suddenly comes from. I mean, it, it, it goes, this would be nice if it were the case, it corresponds with when he did his stint at the policy planning unit with George Kennan at the State Department, which was from 1451. And Kennan, right from that moment on, also uses moralism. Um, so maybe, but again, I'm looking here at the people who've been in the archive much more recently than I have, whether there is some, some sense in this. I'm not sure whether it's really all that important, except if it does actually come out of the practitioners to what I'm doing. If this is something he had picked up precisely through the discussion he had with George Kennan and his colleagues in the Hague. Because suddenly this is also the time where his the type of examples he uses are different in his writing. Suddenly it's about taking diplomatic negotiations with the Soviets as examples for moral reasons. Whereas before a lot of his, obviously that's also because the Soviet Union, the Cold War had just started before because he was using a different number, a different type of, um, of example. So I've been trying to, to dig this up and come that this was quite quite a challenging one to see where this moralism stuff comes from. And then, well, what, what can we say about it? Well, the first, of, first is that those who did use it, and a lot of his um, realist colleagues they did, Kennan and Dean Aiton and uh, Schlesinger Jr. and all these people use the word, but they don't use it in a very coherent fashion, uh, to say the least. And the common one that even Kennan then 30 years later in the publication acknowledged, he said, well, we were very cryptic, he uses the word cryptic about it, and it left it open to all kinds of misinterpretations, including that morality is equated with moral. And perhaps this is already where some of this comes from, that just as the word legalism has often been interpreted to mean we really just thought international law was irrelevant to the study of international politics, that moralism, in a way, perhaps did exactly the same thing. It kind of got rid of a lot of normative theory outside of especially America by our debates um, as an aside. But, but it's true that suddenly in the later years Ken Thompson starts doing this, they all try to make this distinction between moralism and morality. Um, and this I think goes again into all the things we've already been hearing this morning. Um, so they themselves obviously didn't do themselves any, any favor. Often moralists, a moralist was just somebody that didn't who was engaging in some sort of moral reflection. Moral philosopher was called a moralist. Um, Tracing us has called the moralization of foreign affairs, or basically, I think, just means thinking about the moral aspects of foreign policy. Um, so they had all this kind of uh, kind of usage in there. Um, what I then try to do is link this with uh, literature that in philosophy exists, because there are only a couple of couple of philosophers, including I think Tony Covey, who's looked at this and says, why is it that moral philosophy? There is a little bit about there. There was a, a few workshops and, and um, special editions and special issues of journals that try to, to look at what moralism actually could mean and can we think of this in a meaningful way. And already there, it's not obvious to, and there were disagreements amongst the, the people writing on this, whether it's a vice or a virtue. Some people say moralizing can be a good thing. Right? It's telling people and making them aware of their moral obligations of their moral duties. Whereas mostly, and I think this is also the way it's a vice, it's a bad thing. Right? Moralizing is something that, in a way, you have to warn against. But again, there, the literature shows, and there's, there, there are quite a few distinctions and various definitions and typologies of what this could mean. So this could, on the one hand, mean the kind of, you know, an excess of morality, an over-moralizing of, of the debate. And you can think, for instance, of Mr. Pecksniff in Charles Dickens' Martin Chuzzlewit, right? He is your moralizer. Virtues uh, answer to, to all kinds of problems that he's been confronted with, right? So over moralizing is something, but I don't think this is necessarily more than Bell and, and Coles were on about. Another way perhaps was to think about it as an inappropriate resort to morality, thinking about things through moral ends when actually there is no need to or there is no justification for. Again, it's linked to the first one, but again, I don't think it's necessarily what Morton Bell and Coles were doing. Then perhaps there's also the argument you can be. 
can make two abstract and useful morality. And this is perhaps what I can throw back at my colleagues in, in Zurich, um, that this is also a type of moralizing when it does not have the relation to its surroundings, to the subject matter that it's looking at, when it is so up in the ivory tower that it doesn't allow um, to, you to, to make real demands for it or in terms of, in terms of in this case, political life, for instance. And then there is the, the one, I think, that what they call moralism or deluded power, which perhaps is the one that comes closest to what more well, the others were getting at when they use the term moralizing or moralism, right, where there are some hidden hegemonic aspirations um, where certain hegemons try to universalize their own ideas in a way that um, goes again into what Longo was saying, which really the, the, the morals of a particular nation state. And this is quite problem, problematic in a way, and we've been discussing this for quite a while, and the universal aspirations of, of others. Or can you even think about it in these terms? So I ended up getting myself into lots of hot water with this, um, trying to get a, to grips with what moralism could or could not be. Um, and I think, in a way, the, the conclusion was, well, it's not moral philosophy. This isn't about making a substantive claim or having a debate within moral philosophy. So this is actually what I would tell my, my colleagues in Zurich, right? Moralism and everything that comes with it is about, in a way, um, unmasking a certain hidden discourse that has this, this moralizing rather than trying to go into the substance in, in a way that a moral philosopher would be. And I think this is an, an important thing that you can also, going back to today's world, you can, you can look at, right? And it also goes back to what, what um, our project is about, what, what you can call the, this kind of global governance without government, as it's often called, right? This, this whole good governance debate, which I think is, is moralizing to the extreme. Um, but that a lot of people don't pick up on, and a lot of the work I do in, in Geneva, um, and a lot of my students who I teach methods, and they want to do their research puzzle, it's all about this, right? It's about, well, what are the success criteria for, for peace building? How can I do more effective state building if on the ground or whatever? And they all take the good governance agenda as the one and only way that, you know, you can think about these things um, without in any way being able Critically, we take a step back and say, well, hang on, what is, what is that moralizing discourse that is, that is behind there? Um, and in that sense, I think maybe because we have so this problem of finding an obvious alternative to good governance, to this global governance regime, in the practitioner debate, that something like the moralism idea that Morgenthau and Kennan have might be quite useful, not in terms of filling a, a, a container with moral arguments but simply just as a, as a reminder of saying, hang on a minute, what are we doing here? Um, and in that sense, in that sense, even looking at the intervention debate, looking at the way you know, you're talking about conditionality criteria for sovereignty, these supposedly objectively knowable criteria for if you, the state, behave in a certain way, then we, the international community, deem you to be sovereign, which is basically what the art of peace stuff ends up getting you to, right? Um, is what, and here I go back to Koskinemi, the international lawyer, who calls this the new moral internationalism. And he's, he's developed this on a number of articles over the last decade, looking in the way actually also international law is applied to issues such as intervention, that there is this moralization in a way of the debate, which for the international lawyer, the critical international lawyer, that he is, um, is, is, is quite problematic. Um, and in that sense, perhaps, um, one could take Kevin seriously, I just have one, one quote here, where he he talk, talks even of the histronics of moralism. He says that we have to avoid those histronics at the expense of its substance. And by that is meant the projection of attitudes, poses, and rhetoric that cause us to appear noble and altruistic in the mirror of our own vanity, but lack substance when related to the reality of the international life. I mean, a lot of this moralism literature then also criticizes Kennan and the others for some sort of cultural relativism, saying, well, that we also didn't really think of that there may indeed be certain norms that override the nation state or the human rights or whatever. So there are obvious arguments against this kind of um, debate as well. But I think um, as a hook with which to think about a certain type of crisis to come back to the theme here, moralism 
without necessarily coming with this more philosophical substance is quite a quite a useful heuristic about for thinking about and warning.